Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destinations, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency, Struts, which they earn by watching. This video covers three streams or 12 hours of gameplay, and we begin with a Uranus supply launch, which will be to the benefit of the Kerbalized version of Miko Gagozov, who is already on the way to the light blue planet. So here we are on the pad with the supply vessel right at the top there, and that's on top of a Timberwind pebble bed nuclear reactor stage, and then that is on top of the Daenerys Aerospike SSTO. We are waiting for the Daenerys Aerospike SSTO's engines to rev up to full thrust here, which takes a while, and then we can release the clamps. So there we go, and... That is it on its way out of Cape Canaveral. That's the Timberwind stage with its huge hydrogen tank. And a tiny little fairing on top for the supply vessel. The supply vessel is powered by ion engines. And here we go. Controlling an SSTO is always interesting because you really have to manage the ascent properly. And I didn't really. That's why we were pointing down like that. Uh, that's to correct the fact that I didn't quite do it right. I'm really proud of the flap closure on the Aerospike SSTO, which protects the engine on descent. I like that animation. But we are not going to bring it back this time. The little pods on the side of the Daenerys, by the way, have two Raptor engines each in them, and that's for a descent burn right at the end of descent to set down safely. Anyway, this is the burn for Uranus. It's direct. We are not using a Jupiter slingshot or anything. And so we're going to use up this stage, and then it's going to be ion engines for the remainder. And here we go with the 10 tons of ion engines, basically on the tail of this, plus a small nuclear reactor in order to power them. And we wouldn't be able to power them with solar panels, obviously, because we're going out to Uranus, which doesn't get, get much sun. So, But we have been using nuclear reactors for the ion engines all this time. So we proceed... And finally, we get our Uranus encounter. And so these supplies, Fubar and Oxygen, uh, will be on their way to Mikko. Well, we'll get there. I don't remember whether it was before or after Mikko actually gets there. It might be before even. Uh, it's a 20-year trip, so we really needed the supplies. It's a 20-year trip back, too. Anyway, here we are at Mercury, where we had captured a whole lot of missions in the previous videos. And this time, we really need to get them together somehow. And so here is R3 King's mission. Him being the instigator of this entire ordeal. And I'm trying to get some food, water, and oxygen into his vehicle from the rescue stage. What brought him into orbit around Mercury. But we are using that stage to help Arthur rendezvous with the lander. This is the lander. Arthur wanted to land on Mercury. And the original lander had to be ditched so that we could save Arthur. And now we are getting the replacement lander over to him. And so that's what these burns are for. Once things are in orbit around Mercury, you can take your time. However, we really have to make sure the orbits are close together before the actual rendezvous occurs, because otherwise you won't have enough time to do the final rendezvous burn, which is what we're doing here. And you can see how long it takes to change our orbit by just uh, 0.1 meter per second here and there. And as we approach, we aren't going to dock these things together. Uh, there's no point. Arthur would have to EVA into the lander in any case. So that is what Arthur is doing now. And now for the audacious landing on Mercury, which is not easy, by the way. It's not like the moon. It looks like the moon. But our orbital speed around Mercury is much higher than that around the moon. Um, and we'll take a look there. You can see 2,700 meters per second or so. And the moon is just 1,600. So Mercury has some decent gravity to it. And then we have to get off of Mercury safely. So we have uh, multiple stages here. We've got an initial descent stage that will drop off during descent. We're making the first descent burn here. And then we'll use the lander's own tanks for the last bit of descent, and then all of ascent, of course. So this is the descent stage. We're using here the Gemini lander engines, 
which are, and they go with the light Gemini lander can, which is what we are using to carry Arthur here. The lightest possible lander cabin that we could get. Basically, something wrapped around the Kerbinaut, more or less. For the most part, it was a continuous deceleration, and quite a lot of deceleration, so pretty harrowing. I mean, efficient, but harrowing. And then here we are finishing up this bit. I decided to get it to a hover a little bit early, as it turns out. We should have probably descended more first before doing this. And But I wanted to ditch the this descent module early. And go on to the next stage quickly, so that I'd know how to deal with the final touchdown, basically. So we've got a long way to go still, 6 kilometers in altitude. The main thing here is just to make sure that I have enough Delta V to get back into orbit afterwards. So as long as that's true, we can use as much as we like. But still, this, this final bit wasn't handled as well as I would have liked. I didn't really want to shut down the engines because it takes a little bit of time for them to get back up. So if I shut them down, there would be a delay and I didn't want that. But. By not shutting them down, we had a really long sort of wait until touchdown here. Just sort of waiting, waiting. But it's best to be careful, of course. We've come all this way. It's been a long time. I didn't want to mess this up now. But seriously, one meter. It's, it's, come on, come on. No shadow and touchdown. Oh, oh, oh! Really hard on that forward engine there. Okay, anyway, it turned out that I didn't place the tanks properly. They should have been at like a 45 degree angle from where they were. That would have been better, especially for that ladder. But anyway, Arthur got off there and time to. We, it's not science mode, it's. Um, it's sandbox mode, so the science doesn't matter. We just need to plant a flag here. And so I said, well, uh, that took a while or something like that. And I don't know whether that was the landing or the entire ordeal of getting to Mercury. Either way. Now, the jetpack is not good enough to get us off of the surface of Mercury, unfortunately. So I had to scramble up here using the climb function and that actually worked. Sometimes it doesn't work so well, but this time it worked. And board. So that was the end of the first stream uh, when we touched down. And that's why we don't have any audio because this stream I lost the original recording of and I'm using the Twitch version, which I can't use the audio of because I'd be talking. So anyway, off go the drop tanks, which were the part for the descent. So we could jettison them and actually, that might have been possible on the surface to free up the ladder. I don't know. But uh, maybe had a little bit of fuel there that I didn't want to waste. Okay, so taking the ladder in, speaking of the ladder, and continuing to orbit. It's a long way to orbit. It's not quite as much as Mars, but it's still quite a high speed here that we have to get to. And there we are. And that's enough for a decent rendezvous, 1,000 meters per second left over. So margin's not so tight in this case. And here we are approaching the original vessel. And of course, Arthur has to EVA out and get back into the Gemini capsule there. We did allow extra space. You see, this, uh, it's just one Kerbal and there's a whole extra big Gemini cabin underneath it. Um, and, you know, a trip to Mercury is not as long as a trip to Mars. Though in this case, it was sort of long. Anyway, I immediately plotted the opportunity back from Mercury to Earth. But we had to time warp a little bit until the next thing we had to do. And so I decided to focus on the Uranus mission with Mikko to just make sure that the water recycling was working properly. And also food and oxygen. It has a recycler for those. And this is Arthur's girlfriend, Katak, who is also approaching Mercury and will meet up with him after his triumphant journey to the surface. This is the Mercury station. And so it's got lots and lots of food, water, and oxygen. So she was never in any danger 
in that respect. And we have to make a rendezvous. So that's a little bit complicated. Ion engines again. And so just capturing around Mercury is a trick. Must plan that properly, of course. But yep, that is the station and a fairly large xenon tank there. And we have capture. So another awkward orbit to deal with. But we, uh, you can see the little markers indicating that we do have a rendezvous opportunity, but we have to manage it properly so that we can do the burn on time. And meanwhile, I had to take care of another mission. This was an Attila supply mission. This is bonus supplies for Mercury, just in case. So just food, water, and oxygen using the Attila thruster setup we also had. But now back to Katak. And... Right here, I decide we need to make the rendezvous burn already, just to have enough time. And we have four Gemini lander engines on this to provide supplementary power in case the ion engines do not provide enough thrust. So we take advantage of those. And so those are running at this point, which is why we're in physical time warp instead of full time warp. The ion engines can work in full time warp, but not the Gemini lander engines. Gemini lander engines, for those who don't know, are just hypergolic engines. We see. We've seen so much of them in this particular video, but they're uh, Erosine 50 and NTO engines, about 16 kilonewtons, 311 seconds ISP, something like that. They have infinite ignitions and they throttle, so they're really useful. So anyway, we use them to make the rendezvous and here Arthur is docking with the station after separating from the Attila salvation vehicle or whatever you want to call it. and. I have to be careful with this. There are the small docking ports that are propellant only docking ports. So, and the RCS on this vehicle is not great, but we manage it. So, Arthur is docked and back with Katak. And we also want to dock the Attila vehicle that saved, that was rescuing Arthur. So, that too also docks with the station. And these are all very heavy vehicles. You can see the mass down below there. Pretty interesting getting all this around Mercury, but of course we used really large launchers, so that does tend to make things easier. So here we are. And docked. All right, so all is good with the Mercury missions now. And yeah, yeah, it's about time. It's about time. So. That was actually the end of that stream, and then on to the next one. Uh, we had a Mars window. So this is a Mars supply vessel. And in contemplating what kind of engine I would use for this, I decided to go with the Orange, which is a methane oxygen tug, or a surface delivery vehicle, sky crane, if you will. And that supply vessel is being launched on a SLS with Raptor 9 boosters and also my shuttle mice which carry the RS-25s for recovery. Conceptually those are by Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, the makers of Dream Chaser, but anybody can make them, uh, it's fine. This is not the ultimate collaborative SLS incidentally, that one would have a New Glenn upper stage with two BE-3U boosters, uh, sorry engines but we do not have those. There I was locking the tanks so that we could shut off the engines on the Raptor 9 boosters so that they could save their fuel for a potential landing on a barge or whatever or return to launch site however much they had. I just wanted to save fuel so that they were in theory recoverable. Anyway, but again this does not have the New Glenn upper stage so that's why it's not the ultimate collaborative SLS. There go the fairings, thankfully not striking the shuttle mice. And we don't quite make it to orbit with uh, the shuttle mice. And so we need to use the nuclear stage at the top, it's another Timberwind stage, in order to complete orbit. So, okay, there we go, lighting the nuclear stage, and it puffs. Takes a bit of time to warm up. And there's just a single Timberwind. I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, Timberwind 75, so 750 kilonewtons, or 75 tons of thrust, I should say. Okay, I decided to try and bring back one of the shuttle mice, just to see how that would work out. 
So it's actually boosting it, so we're trying to mitigate the periapsis here because it didn't manage to get a high enough periapsis. And I saved a bare amount of MMH and NTO, which it has on board for the re-entry. And so here it's coming back down. Uh, we had that stupid decoupler still on it, unfortunately, so that started heating up. A minor flaw, the engines are heating up too, and they get rather hot, but not too hot, just barely, really just barely. And we do get through the worst of it with them intact. Again, a very close call there. And on to the surface. Well, that's a bit of a trick. This is a very heavy thing with not much surface area. There's not much wingage here. It is a lifting body, uh, basically. But there's not that much lift. And control isn't great either. Because so much of it is occluded by the body. Right, and we do have fair mirror space, so that's being taken into account somewhat. Anyway, uh, the wiggle dampens, thankfully enough. And ultimately, we have to go down at 40 degrees to just keep our speed constant. And here I am now pulling up from that 40 degree down situation in order to try and land. And I put the gear down, hopefully. But I have no idea exactly the stall speed of this, except that it's really high. And I think we do in fact stall. I just can't lift the nose anymore past a certain point. Or even lifting the nose, I don't uh, get an increase in vertical speed. So, well, it explodes. But perhaps a computer or a more competent pilot would be able to land it safely. At least we got through the re-entry, so that part of it is validated. Anyway, this is off to Mars, so this is the Mars transfer. No big uh, problems here. They can certainly deal with that, and we use the orange to finish up our burn. I've, I hope we put some MLI layers to mitigate the boil off on that orange. Otherwise it's going to have a hard time, but we'll find out when we get there, I suppose. So it does have its approach, and next up, I just decide to send uh, the back end of that, the orange plus the extra spherical tanks of methane and oxygen, over to Mars as a tug. So not with the supply container. So that's what we're launching here, once again, same launch vehicle. Somebody had asked me whether I contemplated speeding up the launches in this series or any other thing. And especially in this series, I can't do it because of the music. Because the in-game audio and the music are on the same track. If I tried to speed it up, the music would sound really weird and distorted. And I wouldn't want to lose... If I can get the in-game audio with the thrust and all, especially during the launches, I wouldn't want to lose that. Uh, so, yeah. Because the music and the engine sounds are on the same track, I don't think I can speed up the... The video for launches and besides I cut them anyway to the essential bits like decouplings and stuff like that so not much incentive there for speeding up the video sometimes I will speed up the video to make it real time but not in this series okay well anyway this is on its way and I became enthralled with using the orange for everything apparently and so I came up with an orange lander uh, not too sure this was the brightest idea. Uh, we're using the cabin from the ILV, the integrated uh, lunar vehicle or landing vehicle for the moon, whatever. Uh, the one from the Blue Origin Northrop proposal. And we are sending that over to Mars. And we've got parachutes on top, of course, for the landing bit. So the orange really only has to lift it off again and get back to Mars orbit. But yeah. Uh, but actually, my luck with Mars landers has not been high uh, overall. So anyway, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. Yeah, lots of work to do as far as Mars landers are concerned. There are lots of possible ways to make them. And of course, there's Starship, which is the, what I like to think of as the brute force method. but. Mostly, I've been using the parachute down method. But the brute force method sure makes it easier. But yeah, there's a whole variety of different ways to get stuff down onto Mars. And 
Yeah, it takes some exploration. It's not like the moon. The moon, you've got one way to land, basically. Maybe two ways to land. You can land just with a soul descent stage or land with a descent stage that cuts off and then you land actually with the ascent stage. Okay, well anyway, here is the Timberwind. Nuclear engine doing its work again. Made full use of this this time around. And of course, it continues on to do the transfer burn. I didn't try recovering the shuttle mice after that one recovery attempt. Uh, that was just a test. It was a proof of concept sort of thing. So we do have our approach to Mars after a little bit of a correction. And that's all right. We will see if everything works out for us on that. Don't know about boil off. Once again, it all depends on whether I add the MLI layers, and that is not visible on the resources. We we can see some is being used, but that's being used by the RCS right now. So, well, maybe there's some boil off there. Anyway, we will see in future episodes. So for now, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.